Uh, thanks for the invitation. So um, I'll be talking about some work um, with David Conlon from Oxford and Jacob Fox from MIT. So 10 years ago, Ben Green and Terry Tao proved a remarkable theorem that the prime numbers contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Uh, so I remember first hearing about this theorem when I was uh, still a high school student and being quite excited. You know, such a simple sounding result, but you know, of course the proof is very, very deep. Uh, okay, so here's some examples of such uh, arithmetic progressions in the prime numbers. Uh, and so the purpose of this talk is to explain for you the, uh, the main outline in the proof of the Green Tau theorem as we uh, now come to understand it. Uh, so we've done some work where we simplify the main technical ingredient in the proof, and I will explain that. So to talk about the Green Tau theorem, I must also talk about Samaretti's theorem. So Samaretti proved in the 70s that if you take a subset of the positive integers with positive density, then the set must also contain arbitrarily long arithmetic progressions. Now the density is defined in the usual way. So for example, the even numbers have density one half. We know from the prime number theorem that the primes have density decaying as one over log n. And so Samaretti's theorem itself does not directly imply green tau theorem. And in fact, uh, even the best quantitative bounds on Samaretti's theorem known today are not quite enough to prove the green tau theorem directly. Although for the three-term case, the best bounds due to Tom Sanders come incredibly close, still yet not enough. It is a famous conjecture of Erdős that the density of the primes alone should imply that they contain long arithmetic progressions. But that's uh, still an open conjecture, and that's something that you know, people would very much love to prove. So then, what is green tau strategy, given that they are not improving on Samaretti's term for the purpose of proving uh, the result of all primes. But the strategy is as follows. I first start with my set of primes, P. And they embed these primes in a somewhat larger set. For the purpose of this talk, uh, let's call this set the almost primes. Now, this is not quite an accurate description, but it's a sufficiently good image to keep in mind for our purpose. And you can think of P being embedded in Q as a set of positive relative density. And they show two things. First, they show a relative Samaretti theorem, which informally says that if you start with a set S, so here S is my Q, and if S satisfies certain pseudo-randomness conditions, then it satisfies this relative Samaretti property, meaning that every subset of S of positive relative density contains long arithmetic progressions. So this is their main uh, technical result in their work. In the second step, they construct such a pseudo-random host. Where starting from the primes, they construct this su superset of primes, or more generally a majorizing measure, which satisfies the desired pseudo-randomness conditions. And for this part, uh, they borrow ideas from, at the time, recent works of Goldstern and Yoderim on um, uh, small gaps between primes. I will mostly focus on the combinatorial aspect of it in this talk, and this is the part that we improve on. So what do I mean by pseudo-randomness conditions? <coughs> in Green and Tau's work, they require two different kinds of pseudo-randomness conditions, which they call linear forms condition and correlation condition. I'll explain what the linear forms condition is in more detail, but the correlation condition it suffices to say that it's a, it's a somewhat more technical con condition that seems less natural for the purpose of this particular problem. And it almost feels as if it shouldn't be there. This is a very interesting result, I think, in of its own. And a natural question that arises is, well, what pseudo-randomness conditions do you really need to guarantee such a consequence of having, you know, uh, dense subsets containing long APs. So can you do with weaker and more natural pseudo-randomness conditions on the host set? And our main result is that you can, in fact, completely get rid of this correlation condition, and we can use a 
much weaker form of Greenhouse linear forms condition. And I'll explain what our linear forms condition says, and it has, I think, a fairly natural interpretation. So um, to give an overview of things, so we started out with Samaretti's theorem, where you can think of it as a result where the host set is all of the positive integers, and relative Samaretti theorem, where the host set is, instead of the entire set of positive integers, just some sparse set. In both cases, the conclusion is that a relatively dense subset should contain long arithmetic progressions. To put our work in some context, you can ask, well, what about different kinds of host sets? So if you start with a random host set, so for instance, I take 1 to n, and I choose each element to be in my set with some probability p, you know, when does it have this property? So this question was first studied by Koyakawa, Kuchak, and Rodo in the 90s, where they proved that for uh, three-term arithmetic progressions, the, this probability is the correct threshold. So for p above 1 over square root of n, uh, you have this property. And for p much less than that, you don't have that property. And more generally, there was a breakthrough uh, a few years ago by Colin Gowers and independently Schacht, where they resolved this problem in general for co o k-term arithmetic progressions. So this is in the random case. Uh, in this talk, I will only talk about the pseudo-random case. And as I mentioned, Green and Tao proved a version of this relative similarity theorem under the conditions of linear forms and correlation. And we prove it under uh, just correlation. In fact, a slightly weaker version of their, of their uh, just under linear forms, and a slightly weaker version of their linear forms. Yep. That's right, one direction. So for p much less than this, you can show that there is uh, much fewer 3 aps than the number of elements in your set. So you can just take out those 3 aps and destroy all the 3 aps. Right, so it's the, it's the existence that's a harder direction. Okay, any other questions? Okay. So, um, so I want to first outline a proof of this classic result of Roth on three AP free sets. So it says that, so this is the three term uh, version of Samaretti's theorem. It says that if you have a set which is three AP free, then it contains a sublinear number of elements. It will be somewhat easier to work in Z mod N because of the cyclic group structure. And roughly these two settings are the same. The only difference is that in Z mod N, you're allowed wraparounds, or the three APs could wrap around zero. But there's a standard trick to get rid of that, which is to, if you start with 1 to n, then you bet embed this in a slightly larger cyclic group so that wraparounds no longer cause an issue. So for our purpose, these two settings are really the same, and we'll just work with z mod n. So let me show you a, a graph theoretic proof of Roth's theorem. So this is not Roth's original proof, which is through Fourier analysis, but it's a graph theoretic proof. And the point of this is to motivate a construction that will be needed to, to explain the pseudo-randomness condition. Starting with my set A, as a subset of Z mod M, let me construct the following tripartite graph, where I have three sets of vertices, x, y, and z, uh, where the vertices are labeled all by elements of Z mod N. I put in my edges as follows. So between x and uh, the set, so between these two vertex sets, I put in an edge between x and y if and only if this linear form 2x plus y is in my set A. Okay, so that's just some rule for putting in the edges. You can think of it as a modified KD graph. Similarly, I put in an edge between x and z if x minus z is in my set A, and between, x, uh, between y and z if minus y minus 2z is in A. Okay, so these are just the rules for putting in the edges. Okay, so why do I put in these edges? Uh, why do I choose these three linear forms? It's because if I think about what are the triangles in this graph, right, so when do vertices x, y, and z form a triangle? They form a triangle if and only if these three linear forms are all in my set A. Okay, so that's just reading off the rules. But these three expressions, notice that they form a three-term arithmetic progression with this common difference. And so that's the reason why those three linear forms were chosen. 
So triangles in this graph correspond precisely to three-term arithmetic progressions in the set A. But I started out with a set A, which doesn't have any three-term arithmetic progressions. So does that mean that there's no triangles in this graph? Well, almost. Not quite, but almost. There are still some triangles because we still have some trivial three-term arithmetic progressions with common difference zero, and they're still being picked up by this graph construction. So, but these are the only triangles. And in particular, one notices that every edge in this graph is contained in exactly one triangle, namely the one that completes the equation x plus y plus z equals to zero. Right, so to summarize, there's this graph which has 3n vertices, 3n times a edges, so think of it as a Cayley graph, so there are a edges between, so coming out of every vertex between every two vertex sets. And every edge is in exactly one triangle. And there's a, a nice result of Ruscha and Samaretti in the 70s that says that such a graph, if every edge is containing exactly one triangle, has a subquadratic number of edges. Uh, so this is a consequence of what's known as a triangle removal lemma. Using this result, we deduce that the number of edges is little o of n squared, and hence a has size little o of n. And so that completes the proof of Roth's theorem. Of course, most of the content of the proof is sort of hidden in, in this result. And uh, so to the standard proof of this uses Samaritis regularity lemma. But the point of you showing this proof is not necessarily to show you how to prove Ross theorem, but I want to use this construction, this graph theoretic construction on the previous si slide. And this explanation shows that that construction is related to three-term arithmetic progressions. Okay. So now I want to explain what is the pseudo-randomness condition that we use in relative Samaretti theorem, in particular relative Roth theorem. So relative Roth theorem for us says the following. If I start with a subset of Z mod M, which satisfies what I will explain, a three linear forms condition, then a subset of it, which is 3AP free, contains a, uh, a has necessarily to be sparse, relatively speaking, to the host set. And what is this three linear forms condition? Well, if I start with this graph GS, so this is the same construction as before, except that I build my edges based on the set S, the host set S. And so I draw in these edges using basically the same rules. Then the three linear forms condition says that this graph GS is pseudo-random in the following sense. That if I want to count the number of embeddings of K222, so K222 is this object here, then the number of embeddings of K222 should be roughly the same as the number of embeddings of K222 into a random graph of the same density. So uh, if my set S has density P, then the density of embeddings of these things should be uh, P to the power 12th power, up to a 1 plus to a 1 uh, multiplicative correction. We need just a bit more. We want to say that not just for K222, but also all subgraphs of K222. For example, this thing should also have the correct number of embeddings. But that's it. Right? So just saying that these subgraphs have the correct number of embeddings, uh, that's all the pseudo-randomness conditions that we need, and this guarantees this relative Ross theorem. So that's the result. Yeah. Uh, ah, okay. So I will, so this is my next slide. So let me, um, Draw some, okay, so of course K222 comes out of the proof, but just to convince you that it's a natural condition, let me draw some analogies to some classical results about quasi-random graphs. So in the late 80s, so Chung, Graham, and Wilson have this famous result that, uh, so they explored the notion of quasi-randomness in graphs and showed that there's a number of different <laughs> definitions, all of which are equivalent. And one that in particular that stands out, so some of these conditions are eigenvalues, co-degree conditions, subgraph counts, and so on. But there's one condition that stands out as having the correct C4 count. 
And just having the correct C4 count is equivalent to a host of other pseudo quasi-randomness conditions. But just for dense graphs. So their results only work for dense graphs. And they break down if you have sparse graphs. One way to see our result as an analogy to um, this type of result is that if I want to study some extreme or Ramsey type result about a graph H, so for the purpose of Ross theorem, H is a triangle, as I as we saw earlier in the in the graph theoretic proof of Ross theorem. So if I want to know some extremal results about the triangle in a sparse graph, then I have everything I need, provided that there is some host graph which behaves pseudo-randomly with respect to the two blow-up of the triangle. So that's one way to, to, to remember this result. And in retrospect, you can view Chang, Graham, and Wilson as saying that I have knowledge about dense graphs if I know the correct count of the two blow-up of a single edge. Whereas for sparse graphs, if I want to know something about triangles, I need to know the two blow-up of a triangle. Okay, so that's just an analogy. Um, okay. So uh, more generally, relative Samoretti theorem, where I have long, longer arithmetic progressions, but KAPs, uh, says the same thing, except I switch out this three linear forms condition by what we call the K linear forms condition. And that's a natural generalization of this graph theoretic construction where now instead of taking graphs, I now take a hypergraph. So for example, for four term arithmetic progressions, I built for you a four partite, sorry, there's no weighted here, so four partite, a three uniform hypergraph. So all the vertex sets are Z mod N. I put in my edges according to these rules, you know, very similar to the rules that we saw earlier. And so these rules are chosen so that uh, these linear forms, they form a four-term arithmetic progression, so just like what we saw earlier. And the pseudo-randomness condition is that this graph constructed here, this hypergraph constructed here, has the correct count of the two blow-up of the simplex. So the simplex is the complete three uniform graph on four vertices. So they're the faces of a tetrahedron. And that's it. And so it's just a, it's a natural generalization of the, what we saw in the three case. For the rest of the talk though, I will just talk about the three AP case. Uh, it turns out, so if you're familiar with Samaritan's term, you know that for in all different proofs of Samaritan's term, actually all of the proofs are difficult, but in all the different proofs, the three-term case is substantially easier than the longer uh, version. It turns out, though, for the purpose of proving relative Samaritan theorem, and I'll outline the strategy of the proof on the next slide, for the purpose of proving relative Samaritan theorem, there is no, at least the way we do it, there's no technical difference in difficulty between 3AP or longer AP. The notation gets a bit more clumsier, which is why I don't want to talk about longer APs, but the substance of the proof is all contained in what I will explain for three-term arithmetic progressions. So I'll just do three-term from now on. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of different approaches. Uh, we first arrived at this result um, in this paper that uh, titled A Relative Summary Theorem, where we transfer the hypergraph removal lemma. Okay. So this is one of the ways of proving Samaritan's theorem to this hypergraph removal lemma, and we transfer it, meaning that we assume this hypergraph removal lemma as a black box and transfer it down to a sparse setting. Subsequently, I found a, a different approach of proving more or less the same result, where instead of transferring a particular way of proving Samaritan's theorem, I transfer Samaritan's theorem directly, meaning that if you start with any proof of Samaritan's theorem, for example, any Fourier theoretic proof or anything, then I can transfer that proof and it's bounced down to the sparse setting. And so this is the approach that I will explain in this talk. It's somewhat more direct, whereas this hypergraph proof is somewhat more general and it could be applied to uh, uh, some other situations. And this is it's a short note. Okay. So, so here's an outline of what the, the proof uh, of relative Roth theorem is. So I start with relative Roth's theorem. One way to say this is that, is that if I fix a delta, 
then any such set with a least density delta should contain a three-term arithmetic progression, provided oh, it's always n is large enough. It will be helpful, and there's a standard averaging argument, to go from this version of Ross term to a counting version, where I get not just one 3AP, but many 3APs, a quadratic number of 3APs. Okay, so this is a, a fairly standard argument. Roughly, it goes like this. If I start with a set A that has this density, then I just sample a, a AP of length n naught, where n naught is some large but fixed uh, constant. And then by this version, I see at least one 3AP. But if I keep sampling, then I would see a quadratic number of 3APs. So it's a standard sampling argument. From this counting version, then we can prove this relative Ross theorem using the following outline. So I start with a sparse set of, um, so a sparse set A contained inside some pseudo-random S. The first step, we find a dense model, A tilde for A, where A tilde is a, an approximation for A in some cut norm sense that I will explain later. But the, the main thing to remember here is that A tilde is a dense subset. And the density of A tilde in Z mod n is roughly the same as the relative density of A in the set S. And then there will be another step called a counting lemma, which will tell us that if A tilde is a good approximation for A, then the number of three-term arithmetic progressions in A will be similar to that in A tilde once you do the appropriate normalization. But we know from the counting version of Ross theorem that because A tilde is a dense set, that A tilde should contain many A3 APs. Okay. And this would then imply that A also contains many 3 APs. And that basically concludes the proof of the relative Ross theorem. Right. So at this point, you already know that A contains many 3 APs, and we're pretty much done. Of course, there's you know, these two steps, and I need to explain what are these two steps. Okay. So, so this was the counting version of Ross theorem that we saw earlier, that A contains many three-term arithmetic progressions. It will be convenient to work with, a instead of a discrete version, a, a weighted version of Ross theorem where instead of taking sets, I now put weights on my elements of Z mod M. Um, and these two results are equivalent uh, up to a change of constants. So this version says that if I start with any function on Z mod N, taking values, taking bounded values, then the three AP density in my function F, right, so this expression here, so where if F is an indicator function of a set, then this is precisely the three AP density and the 3AP density in the function f is at least c, provided n is large enough. So this is just the, uh, the weighted relaxation of the usual counting version of Ross theorem. It will be convenient to use this for a couple of reasons. One is that in the proof, having weights really helps. The second reason is that if you actually want to prove the green tau theorem about primes, it would be much better to use a weighted, uh, so a weighted setting, where instead of taking majorizing sets, you take majorizing measures. So from now on, we'll switch over to the weighted setting, so the functional form of everything. But this is the weighted version of Ross theorem for dense sets, right, so for the dense version. So what would the sparse version correspond to? If I start with some sparse host set, S, then this corresponds to a normalized measure nu, where you can think of nu corresponding to a set S as the normalized indicator function where I just normalize it so that it has expectation one. Okay. So in particular, nu will not be bounded by one. So there's a scaling that happens here. Then the subset A of S, a uh, relatively dense subset, will then correspond to a function f which is majorized by nu. So this is the condition that corresponds to being a subset. And f will also have expectation at least delta. So this is the condition that corresponds to being relatively dense. 
then a relative Ross theorem says the following. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Um, so, so here's a statement of our relative Ross theorem. If I have a, a majorizing measure nu, which satisfies the three linear forms condition. So this is basically the K222 condition that I mentioned earlier, but I will say it again on the next slide. And any function f, which is majorized by nu, and the expectation of f is at least delta, then the three AP density in f is bounded from below. So this is the, uh, the sparse extension of the dense version of Ross theorem. And this three linear forms condition says the following. Essentially, it's about the density of the K222 object uh, in. Sorry, could you go yeah. back one second? Yeah. Don't you need to implement this equality to mm. normalize by, uh, ah. to normalize by uh, the density of. Ah, so everything's already normalized. Oh, so okay. you should think of this as having constant expectation order. Oh, okay. Right, so, so that's why there's no normalizing. Oh, it's okay. already part of the normalization. Yeah, so f is not just the indicator function, but normalized in the same way that nu is. Yeah. So the three linear forms condition basically says that the density of K222 in this weighted graph, right, so it's the weighted analog of what we saw earlier, that this density is correct, so one <coughs> plus the total one. And if I just write out the whole thing, it would say that this expression here is one plus the total one as well as if any subset of these 12 factors were deleted. And this is the complete statement of our result for a relative Ross theorem. Okay. Now, how do we prove this result? Well, so this is a, essentially the same transference slide that we saw earlier, but now written for the weighted form. So I want to prove this about new um, f and nu. So these are sparse objects. The dense model theorem, the first step, says that we can approximate this f in terms of this cut norm by a dense object, f tilde. So dense basically means that it's bounded. Sparse means that it's not bounded. You want to normalize so that everything has constant expectation order. The second step is a counting lemma, which says that if I have this approximation, then the three AP density in f should be roughly the same as the three AP density in f tilde. And we know from the weighted version of Ross theorem that the three AP density in F tilde is bounded from below. So this then implies the relative Ross theorem that the three AP density in F is at least C, basically. Yeah. Okay, so let me explain now these two steps. First, the dense model theorem. So in what sense does this dense model F tilde approximate the sparse object F? So in the previous approach uh, taken by Green and Cow, they used some notion which is based on the Gower's uniformity norm. Our main simplification here is that we do not at all use the Gower's uniformity norm. Right? So we use something much weaker, which is the cut norm, it's also known as discrepancy. And the advantages, okay, so, so how, do, how do these two approaches compare? The advantage of using the cut norm is that we obtain a much cheaper dense model theorem. Cheaper meaning that we require fewer pseudo-randomness hypotheses. The expense is that it requires a trickier counting lemma, and this is really the main technical advance in our work, that we come up with a new counting lemma based on the cut norm instead of the Gauss uniformity norm. Okay. So what is this um, dense model theorem? So let me first remind you what the cut norm is. So if I start with a weighted bipartite graph, uh, between sets X and Y and some weighted graph G. So I can define the cut norm of G to be this quantity. And essentially it says that the cut norm is small if whenever I take a large set A and large set B here, then the sum of the edge weights between A and B is never too large. So somehow the edge weights, they all cancel out. And so, but precisely it's this expression here, that's the cut norm. From the cut norm definition for graphs, I can define a cut norm on functions on z mod n. 
So starting from a function on Z mod M, basically I construct a bipartite graph where the edge weights are given by F evaluated at X plus Y. And then I take the cut norm of that graph. Um, so written down, it looks like that. So it's the cut norm of this associated graph. So this, 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 so this is the norm on Z mod N. And the dense model theorem then says the following. If I start with a new, which satisfies the following, actually rather weak pseudo-randomness condition, which is that new is close to one in this cut norm, then every function majorized by new can be approximated by a dense model, F tilde. And this approximation also is in terms of this cut norm. Okay, so that's the dense model theorem that we're, we will use. Um, okay. Uh, say again? Ah, so um, it happens because of the normalization, right? So you should think of the expectation of F and the expectation of F tilde as the relative density in the host sets. So F as a set is sparse, but because I start out with new, there's a normalization that boosts up the weights, right? So when I take the expectation of F, that's the relative density of F in the host set. And them being close in cut norm in particular implies that they're close in the expectation. Yeah, so if you just take an A and B to be the whole thing, then it means that they're in particular close in the expectation. Um, okay, so how does one prove the dense model theorem? So I won't actually show you the proof, but let me just outline some of the different approaches. So there's a, there's a more general dense model theorem that applies to uh, other norms, and in particular, the original intention of Green and Tau is to apply it to this variant of the Gauss uniformity norm for the purpose of proving their result. And their original approach was to prove, uh, prove this general dense model theorem using a energy increment type argument, similar to what you would do in a, to prove the regularity lemma, similarities regularity lemma. There was a subsequent simplification due to Gowers and independently Rango, Travis, and Tosiani and Madame, where they came up with a, a very neat proof that's much shorter uh, that involves two ingredients. The first ingredient being a separating hyperplane theorem, also sometimes known as the Hambanach theorem. Uh, so these guys phrased it as the min minimax theorem. So roughly they amount to the same thing. And the second step involves a Weierstrass polynomial approximation theorem. So it's just, these are two different approaches, and this one is consider the simpler approach that was found subsequently. Uh, so it's quite simple and that's in fact made even simpler. So there's an additional observation that says that you know, if you look at this proof and specialize it to the cut norm, then essentially amounts to saying that the dual object to the cut norm is closed under multiplication. So that's not true for the Gauss uniformity norm, but it is true for the cut norm. That the dual objects are closed under multiplication, and that really simplifies things a lot. And that's part of why we get much simpler pseudo-randomness conditions. Um, so with those observations, uh, so we have this form of the dense model theorem that we'll use for relative similarity. So this is so this is weaker than this three linear forms condition. So it's in particular implied by the three linear forms condition. Um, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I don't really know how to explain more than just saying that it's, you know, the cut norm being small. But it is, it is weaker, much weaker than even actually this having small Gauss uniformity norm. Uh, yeah. It's quite good. So uh, what about for longer arithmetic progressions? So I said that I won't really go into what longer arithmetic progressions, but, but let me just say a, a little bit about what the, the correct generalization is. Let's say for four-term arithmetic progressions, so we saw that this involves a three-uniform weighted hypergraph between, um, and 
the correct generalization of the cut norm that we use here. Okay, so the first thing you might come up with is you take subsets of vertices and evaluate the sum of the edge weights. Okay, that's not quite the right thing to do. Uh, the right thing to do is instead of taking subsets of vertices, and now I take a subset of pairs. So I take an underlying two graph and evaluate the discrepancy on top of that two graph. And this is a, it's a fairly standard thing to do if you ta ever talk about hypergraph regularity, for instance. But, um, so, so that's the generalization for hypergraphs and for longer arithmetic progressions. But other than this, everything else is more or less the same. Okay, so that was the dense model theorem. The second step I want to explain, essentially the main technical advance in our work, which is the new counting lemma, the sparse counting lemma. It says that if f and f tilde are closed in this cut norm, then they share a similar 3AP counts. Okay. So first let me explain a, the classical counting lemma for the dense setting. It would be much easier to do this for graphs, and you'll see it's a lot more intuitive. So let's you know, forget about the arithmetic setting for now and just think about graphs. Let's say I have two weighted graphs, um, uh, so th two tripartite weighted graphs, G and G tilde. First, let's think about the dense setting. So dense setting, again, means that they are bounded. The edge weights are bounded. The triangle counting lemma says that if G and G tilde are close in this cut norm, then the triangle densities, so this is the expression for the triangle density, the triangle densities of G and G tilde are close, as long as they're close in cut norm. Okay, so let me show you how to prove this. The proof is very short. Recall the definition of um, the cut norm. One way to phrase it is that if you have G and G tilde, then if I restrict this expectation to any subsets of vertices A and B, then this expectation is never more than epsilon. So this is just a rephrasing of the definition of the cut norm. More generally, I can replace subsets of, a, uh, of x and y by functions, bounded functions on x and y. Just because if you look at this expression here, it's bilinear in these two factors. So it's bilinear in these two factors. Um, so if I want to obtain the extreme extrema for this expectation, allowing myself to vary a and b, the best way to do it is to take a and b at their extreme values, namely 0 and 1, and then that just becomes a set version. Right, so these two versions of the cut norm are equivalent. But now let's take a look at the triangle count. So let me start with the triangle counting G. I claim that I can swap out one of the, the blue factors. So blue is the G and red is uh, G tilde. So I can swap out one of the G by a G tilde at the cost of at most epsilon. The reason is that if I look at the difference between these two expressions here, it precisely has this form if I fix a particular value of z. Right? If I fix any value of z, then the difference has this form, so it's bounded by epsilon. So now I let z vary, then the expectation is still bounded by epsilon. You know, this allows me to swap out one of the factors, and I can do exactly the same thing to the two other factors. Right? And at the end, I obtain that T of G differs from T of G tilde by at most three epsilon. And this completes the proof of the triangle counting lemma in the dense case. Now, what about the sparse case? So sparse, as we call, corresponds to when, let's say G here is unbounded. This entire proof breaks down from step one because if I look at the difference of these two things, then you know, I can't use this condition anymore. Because G is no longer bounded. So one has to do something else. Right? So and this becomes potentially quite tricky. So here's our main um, technical advance, which is the, a new sparse triangle counting lemma. It says that if new satisfies this three linear forms condition, meaning, well, so this is what we saw before, this K222 condition, then we have a counting lemma 
provided that one subgraph is majorized by nu, then the, and the other subgraph is dense. Then there's a triangle counting number. Okay, so how does the proof work? I won't tell you the whole proof, but just I'll highlight some of the elements. So there are three main ingredients. Uh, the first is repeated applications of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So this is a standard technique in this area, as you know, popularized by you know, Gowers through his for uniformity norms and his works there. Uh, so I won't go in too much into this, but it's one of those things where if you've seen it done once, then you'll, you'll recognize it. Here. There's a lot of Cauchy-Schwarz applications. Okay, so the main thing which we introduce is this technique that we call densification. I'll explain this on the next slide. We also um, reduce this problem to the dense case that we saw earlier. So somehow we reduce the, the sparse version to the <coughs> dense version. So let me explain what this densification step is. So Cauchy-Schwartz, okay, so many applications of Cauchy-Schwartz roughly corresponds to uh, each step doubling a vertex. So there's a square involved. Whenever you have a square, a vertex gets doubled. So if you want to count triangles, one of the intermediate steps that you get happens to be this four cycle. Right? So somehow this is a natural obstacle. If you want to count triangles, you better know how to count this guy. Okay, so this comes up, for example, if you start with a triangle and then look at one vertex and double that vertex as a result of the cauchy shorts. So let me explain how do I prove a counting lemma for counting this four cycle. So the four cycle is this, this um, expression here. Well, let's see. Let me create an auxiliary graph called G prime. G prime defined by this formula, but basically what it is is that it records the code degrees, the common number of common neighbors. It records the code degrees between vertices in X and Y. This is, by the way, where having weights really comes in handy. Like everything else I said before, more or less you can do the same thing without weights, but this step, introducing weights, really helps a lot. Even though we started out with a graph, a weighted graph, which is sparsely supported and unbounded, once I take code degrees, things become a lot nicer. They become a lot smoother. So the, the code degrees are more or less bounded. And this is partly because of the pseudo-randomness conditions that we assume on the, on the host set. But the point is that those code degrees are more or less bounded. You can think of them as, uh, okay, they're, they're basically bounded almost all the time. And so let's just think about, think about the G prime as a bounded graph. This allows me to replace two of these factors by a G prime. And now I've arrived at this expression here, which is a triangle count expression. So we went from initially counting triangles, and I said that through some cauchy shorts, one of the things you reduce the counting is a four cycle. And through this reduction, we've somehow gone back to counting a triangle. So at first, it seems like we've gone back in a loop. But we gained something really important, which is that we swapped out one of the pairs, which was initially sparse, by something which behaves like a dense graph. Now, just do it three more times. Oh, two more times. Right, so do it two more times. And then we reduce the whole problem to the dense version of the triangle counting lemma, which we know how to do. Okay. So then this is the rough outline. And this is the main idea, main new idea in the proof of the triangle counting lemma. Um, okay, so this is the outline of the proof of Ross theorem. So I explained to you what the dense model theorem is about and also showed you some aspects of the counting lemma. And then combining everything, you get a proof. And the whole thing is not very long. Um, so of course, you know, I don't have time to go into all the details of this proof. But if you want to learn about the details, so we're finishing off an exposition uh, of the green tau theorem, where we give a, a gentle exposition containing a complete and a self-contained proof of the green tau theorem, also including some of the, the prime uh, the number of theoretic estimates, which are also not too hard. With one caveat is that we have to assume similarity theorem. So that's a, that's a heavy gun that you're not going to be able to prove in this short exposition. And it will be around 25 pages. So we're finishing this up as we speak, and hopefully you should come on really, really soon. And um, so, so if you want to learn more about this proof, so 
that hopefully we'll put on the archive within the next uh, couple weeks or so. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. <laughs>